housing affordability is not a new subject for California. It has become a lot more severe given the shortage in funding and given the polarization of our economy. While we have had even a growing economy during a cycle of 10 years, we had major sectors of our population that really struggled, where folks were displaced from their neighborhoods and they had longer commutes or they had to relocate completely. We've seen some racial and income segregation where folks had to really struggle to find some access to housing. California is in the midst of a historic housing crisis. Even before the pandemic, about 3 million Californians were considered rent burdened, paying more than 30% of their income on their rent. And of those, 1.7 million were considered severely rent burdened, paying more than 50% of their income towards their rent. And now with the pandemic, we see even higher rates of rent burdens and people really struggling to make ends meet an additional quarter million households are newly rent burdened as a result of COVID. And we also know that these new households that are being impacted are disproportionately people of color. One of the effects of our housing shortage is the increasing displacement and gentrification pressures on our vulnerable communities. So by not building enough housing to meet demand, we are asking our most vulnerable residents to compete with new workers for the same existing stock of housing. Whereas if we were able to build more supply, we would be able to better absorb new demand from our growing economy without putting displacement pressures on communities. One of the main reasons for this overall housing crisis in California is really the underbuilding of housing. Supposedly before the pandemic, we were in a housing boom cycle. But when you look at the data behind what California is building, we are only building about 100,000 units of new housing per year, well below what the state estimates we need to be building in order to keep up with existing demand. So the State Housing and Community Development Department estimates that we actually need 180,000 units of new housing annually just to keep up with existing demand. We're only hitting about 100,000 units per year over the last several years. Now, 180,000 units annually may seem like a lot of housing, but if you look historically at what California has been able to produce, uh, we've eclipsed that number many times. Uh, back in the 80s, 70s, 60s, California produced sometimes as high as 300,000 units per year. As a region, pre-COVID obviously, we were the epicenter of the world's innovation economy. The Bay Area attracted the vast majority of all venture capital invested in the United States, even globally. And we were able to grow our job base at a really fast rate. The problem has been that jobs are quick and easy to create when you have the right circumstances. Housing has always been slow and painful, certainly in the last 20 to 30 years. So there's a lag between job creation and housing construction. That's even if you can match the supply with the demand, and we're not doing that. So we're, we've created a situation where it's still six, seven, eight to one in terms of jobs created versus homes built. And demographers will tell you that for every one and a half jobs you create, you need to permit a new home to maintain affordability levels. When you have a rapidly expanding and growing economy dominated by people with third level degree educations, these are people who are making a lot of money and if you're not building sufficient housing to accommodate that kind of growth, the people who get the short end of the stick are the poor. As I like to say, never in human history has there been a shortage of a critical commodity and the poor have received their fair share. So if we refuse to build a sufficient housing to accommodate our growing economy, that say that the results are, are highly predictable. Poor people will get forced out. Poor people will have to ever further and further crowd into smaller and smaller spaces. Those are the fortunate ones. The less fortunate ones are sent over the hill to points east and have to suffer for our painful commutes every day. And then the least fortunate, we expel to Texas. If you're an affordable place to live, go visit Fort Worth. Last year, the data is, I think, 86,000 Californians left for Texas. We have to do a better job 
of accommodating our growth. Otherwise, we'll continue to get a more divided society, a very bifurcated demographic growth pattern where you've got a lot of people doing really well and then you've, we're hollowing out our middle class and then you've got support services and people that work in those industries at the bottom who are generally way below area median income. I think there's this feeling that California is invincible and that people will always want to come to California because of our really strong economy, because of the natural beauty we have here. But at the same time, we're starting to run up against the reality that housing costs can only go so high before groups continue to have to leave the state. Low and, and moderately income households have been leaving the state. It is not until the last few years that we've really realized that the large percentage of our workforce is leaving for places like Texas, like Arizona, like Oregon. And we have no problem attracting high income households. We continue to see an influx of those households into California, but households making upwards of $100,000, we are starting to see a net out migration of those groups. And so I think it's something that we as a state really have to grapple with. Northern California and Southern California, while geographically very far apart, face many of the same challenges. When you look at the percentage of renters who are rent burdened, it's quite similar, both in the Bay Area and Los Angeles. There may be some differences in the typology. You have a bit more land zoned for single family housing in Los Angeles than you do in the Bay Area, which has a little bit more multifamily. But by and large, they face the same housing pressures that we're all experiencing in California. And I would say even outside of, say, the Bay Area and Los Angeles, some of the groups facing the most extreme housing pressures are groups in the Central Valley or groups in the Inland Empire that we don't always consider as having these issues because we, we sometimes think it is less expensive to live in these places. But when you compare the cost of housing and transportation in these places to the incomes that people earn there, there, there is an imbalance. And there is a tremendous pressure for these groups to stay in these places where we have not always considered them to be high cost. The crisis has been accelerated with COVID-19. As we have discussed, housing affordability has been an ongoing challenge for San Francisco and for California. When we confronted the current pandemic, that became a health crisis, an economic crisis that put the spotlight on the housing challenges that we had. Given that our communities of color had a much higher impact of COVID-19, as we all know, that has triggered a lot of racial tensions throughout the city. In San Francisco, the Latinx community represents 15% of the population the share of people that have been infected by COVID-19 in San Francisco, 45% is Latinx. So this current crisis have created a substantial impact on our Black community, on our American Indian community, other communities of color. Now, the scale, our population growth, our economic growth is demanding a different scale of housing production, but the other two dimensions that are essential for this work is the preservation of existing affordability and the protection of tenants. And figuring out how we address a balance across those three areas will be essential for the solution. One of the challenges here is to figure out how can we bring affordable housing without triggering displacement and how we can support a private sector that can produce that small, medium-sized multifamily housing close to transit in commercial areas. How can we support that development in a way that it can be scaled up to the needs that we have? We also obviously need additional public sector funding. Based on data from the state, we know that our levels of home building are at their lowest since April 2012. While we have seen increased home building in some suburban areas, so single family homes, we've seen less starts for apartments, condos. This is an interesting dynamic because nationwide we're starting to see a suburban housing boom, so uh, more starts for single family homes, more people wanting bigger spaces, no longer tied to physical work locations. So this is a big problem because over the past decade, we've only really built homes in two places. We built them in dense urban centers and corridors, 
And then we've also built single family homes in far flung exurban areas. You can see where most of our land here is represented by dark blue. These are areas indicating that there's basically no new home building happening. And these are predominantly single family home areas. And you can see in the red and blue colors, that these are the places where we're actually seeing development and virtually nothing is being built in between these areas. And so this is a problem because we know that building homes only further away from job centers is the absolute worst way to grow. This pattern of growth increases greenhouse gas emissions from higher vehicle miles traveled. It also creates absolutely horrendous commutes. In the Bay Area, we have a whole population of workers who commute upwards of two, three hours each way just to access economic opportunity as a result of housing prices being too high and having to live in suburban, exurban places just to afford a place to live. And we also know that limiting growth in our infill areas pushes housing into fire hazard areas. So this is something that we are living through right now in California, where exurban suburban communities are at continued risk of wildfires. That is only going to become a more serious issue as we see more destructive fire seasons due to climate change. We're in the grip of the worst fire season in California history, and it's just begun. We're at 5,000 square miles burned already, and we're less than two weeks into September. So we are seeing increased home building and construction in the wildland urban interface. That type of growth pattern creates problems on a multitude of levels. First and foremost, the greenhouse gas production. We actually did a report a couple of years ago at the Bay Area Council Economic Institute called Another Inconvenient Truth. And it is really focusing on this issue that if we don't reform how we permit and build housing, the rules and regulations around land use, particularly in urban infill areas, on sites next to jobs, next to transit, we're going to get more and more super commuters forced to the fringes and beyond of our region, forced into driving two hours each way to and from work every day. And 40% of California's greenhouse gases are currently produced by people in single occupancy vehicles. Our land use efforts to resolve that problem have thus far been fruitless. SB 375, which passed in 2008, was supposed to create a mechanism where we would focus growth in urban areas, focus growth next to transit and jobs, and it really hasn't had the type of impact that we'd hoped, primarily because the process that we force developers of housing in urban areas to go through is arduous. It's really painful. It's very political. It's very expensive, and it's very uncertain. If you look at the development patterns that we're getting, it's a direct result of the inputs into the process. So, so in other words, we make it much harder to build homes in the areas we're supposed to be building them, in urban infill areas, and much easier to build them in subdivisions on formerly ag land in the Central Valley for a multitude of reasons. But again, it's, it's a little counterintuitive, but that single family McMansion in an auto-dependent suburb outside Tracy that's a much cheaper product to build than multifamily transit-oriented development in Oakland or Berkeley or San Francisco. It's a fraction per square foot to build that stick frame home. So not only are the politics challenging, the economics are challenging too. And if we're to really turn this thing around and start to really focus growth in the areas where we say we need to focus growth and the areas where we will get a reduced greenhouse gas production, we need to flip the economics we need to find incentives. We need to find ways to make that type of product both politically feasible and economically feasible. And so far, we have not been really doing that particularly well. The commuters, the actual people who are coming in and out of the Bay Area every day to work, they're the ones, by and large, that are locating in the Central Valley. That's on us. 200,000 people a day drive into the Bay Area to their jobs from their homes outside our region. So... When we hear concerns about new housing, there are concerns about high-rise buildings because the size of the buildings feel overwhelming to some communities. There are concerns because people don't want to see changes in their communities. There are concerns because they feel like the new housing is not going to be for their communities. It will be for a population with a higher income level and they will be displaced. So there are multiple challenges to bringing housing into an existing urban fabric. 
So how can we address that? I think we are framing a much more substantial processes of community engagement. And that combined with a set of planning strategies and regulations can get us to that scale. And what I mean is the scale of affordability that is needed, the physical scale within the neighborhood, the, the appropriate number of stories within a particular neighborhood, and targeting the right populations, targeting the people that needs that the most. We have to acknowledge some of the work that CCLEAR and other organizations at the regional, local, and community levels have developed. I think the fact that we have more housing within our cities on infill sites that are so difficult is, is part of your accomplishment that I think needs to be recognized. I think the regional efforts to identify priority development areas as areas that can be supported for housing with access to transit and services is a major accomplishment. We have seen most cities in the Bay Area taking sustainability and resilience more seriously, having conversations about what multifamily housing and infill housing means. I straddle between public policies and public planning and design review and also private development via nonprofit, specifically focusing on affordable housing and permanent supportive housing that services the lowest income and most vulnerable population between 20 to 60 percent AMI and sometimes as low as 15 percent. And these populations usually are chronically homeless individual or at risk of homeless individual or household that needs the most help. Affordable housing and permanent supportive housing development have multiple items that we as developer or on the city side have to evaluate. So some of the challenges on both public and private side really have to examine critically what it means to build affordable housing and how that is placed in the community. Other challenges that I've encountered include the land use and zoning process and if it accommodates housing and affordable housing specifically. Others would be the design of the affordable and permanent supportive housing, whether it fits into the characteristic of the neighborhoods. We want to build something beautiful and accessible and also very inclusive. And then others would include the environmental on CEQA or sometimes brownfield remediation, or we have to understand the CEQA process. And sometimes there may be challenges or opposition throughout the development process. We are a development group that focuses on multifamily. We have built both market and affordable housing. Over the last five years, we've focused exclusively on affordable housing. Our projects are typically in urban areas on infill sites and typically involve some level of either building remediation or soil cleanup. And eight of those projects were EPA brownfield revolving loan fund projects. I don't think there's any industry where every participant is perfect and housing developing is certainly not that. But also you got to remember as a developer, you're likely to spend money for two or three years before you get your first payment. So there's a, there's a high degree of risk and there's a lot of time in between when you get paid. So I don't get paid every two weeks or every month. I get paid every two or three years. So it's a different equation. And you need to be, as a developer, compensated for the risk that you're taking. So it's important that projects are profitable. If projects are not profitable, then banks won't lend on them, right? If you just broke even on a project, a bank wouldn't be interested in lending because there's no margin for error. Your potential profit is the bank's margin of error. Affordable housing developers that are nonprofit play a hugely important role, but so do for-profit developers. So nationally, about 90%, about 89% of affordable housing is built by for-profit developers. So if you take for-profit developers out of affordable housing, you'd lose about nine out of 10 affordable housing units that are built each year. Another important thing to think about is once an affordability level is selected, a nonprofit and a for-profit can only charge the same rent. So HUD sets the rents for each county. At that affordability level, whether it's a 60% AMI or 30% AMI, we're all charging the same rent. So I get when you talk about market rate developers, but they're taking risks too. I think that we've all got to be careful not to paint whole industries with one brushstroke. There's bad actors and there's good actors in every industry. And I think real estate development is the same thing. In affordable housing, 
you need your nonprofit developers and you need your for-profit developers. And really you need more of each working right now because I don't know of any state on the West Coast and certainly not California that couldn't use multiples of the number of affordable housing units that are being developed each year. What we're seeing is that a lot of the sites that we're looking at in California, particularly in the Bay Area, that are urban infill sites typically have some component of an environmental cleanup. We're seeing this trend in California, in Massachusetts, and Connecticut, and even in Southern states in their urban downtowns. I became a developer because I wanted to work in areas that were overlooked by much larger developers. And so I started my company dedicated solely to working in areas that I grew up in and that I live around. I still live in the city of Montebello. For me, when I work to build infill housing in Los Angeles, one of the biggest issues is that if it's vacant or underutilized in Los Angeles, it's vacant for a reason. So it's either contaminated or has some land use issues. So what I look for in city partners is somebody who is willing to help expedite a CEQA process or land use process, and then also somebody who's willing to partner in uh, cleanup actions. But uh, really time is the biggest impediment to affordable housing. I've been working on projects for four or five years and we still have not started construction. We recently purchased a property in San Jose, that we are developing into a 91 unit affordable housing project, 100% affordable. 50% of those units are permanent supportive housing units. And on this site, like many of the urban infill sites that we get, this site is available because it had a former dry cleaner on it. We're a San Francisco based nonprofit developer of affordable housing, and we have kind of a, a footprint uh, up and down the West Coast. We build infill projects. We love to be near transit, and many of these properties have had some prior use. So we do unfortunately run into environmental issues. We have a lot of uncertainty in our business. All affordable housing is a giant game of juggling. Um, we're asking localities to approve projects, but also in some cases to help fund them. And then we go pursue multiple layers of funding, county, state, federal. And all the while, we're trying to do the normal development work of due diligence on the property, entitlement work, making sure that the buildings that we want to build, we can afford to build. So we do appreciate when cities have been through this process the concerns that we have and that everybody has is really about um, some level of certainty or more importantly for us anyway, timeliness. So the process, when we get into it with whatever regulatory agency it is, we don't know the business well enough to be able to project, for example, hey, I've got to go do some monitoring or some uh, groundwater testing and submit that information to an agency, how long is it going to take them to analyze that and help us come to a conclusion about what we might have on our hands here? So in a perfect world, we would love to know that we could have this stuff happen relatively quickly. We're often under pressure from a land seller. You know, I've got a contract and they want to get paid progress payments or ultimately they want me to close. Well, I can't close if I don't have a no further action letter. So getting to that stage as quickly as possible would be ideal. In my most recent experience, it took us you know, three or four months to do the field work, another three or four months of back and forth with the agency to gain their approval. And at the end of the day, what we got was the three mitigation measures that we knew we were going to get going in. Um, and so my simple question to all the folks involved in this are, is there any way to expedite that process? If we're going to agree to some subsurface monitoring and other vapor intrusion uh, mitigations, active or passive in the building. And then the big one, which seems to be more regular these days, is the indoor air monitoring. And can we get indoor air monitoring where if we have several years of satisfactory readings, can we get out from under that? Or do I have to bake a cost to do indoor air monitoring into my operating expenses for the life of the project? That is really painful. We have a site that we are developing in Bell Gardens that was impacted by some heavy metals and it was a former tow yard. The issue with that is you have to be very careful when taking on the liability for a site like that. Even though we spent 
several months doing tests beforehand, we still hit about a million dollars more of remediation than we would normally have discovered. So it's a tough thing to go after, but most of the time there are not a lot of developers who are in that space who are trying to do housing. We took uh, an environmental insurance policy and we were very careful in the price that we acquired the site. So it's not for those that are conservative in their underwriting, but I think it's really important. In that case, the city of Bell Gardens was very proactive about helping expedite whatever they could because they did need affordable housing in their community. And this housing is for sale townhomes for working class communities. A lot of times the entitlement process can be shortened by using statewide legislation, most recently the SB 35 or legislative AB 2162 or 1763. These help expedite the heights and density of affordable housing and also help shorten the time frame. The ability to build buy rights and the ability to expedite and shorten the entitlement process, including the funding and capital access, um, will help expedite the production of affordable housing and also the timeline that it takes to do pre-construction to construction up until operation. I had dedicated myself to doing something in that area, a promise that I made to my grandmother. Our first project actually bears her name. It's called La Guadalupe, and it's a permanent supportive housing project. We started in 2016, and we look forward to breaking ground very soon. Is actually only on a quarter of an acre. So it's it's a small site. We're building up to five stories because we are in a transit-rich area. But the small ones take sometimes just as long as the large projects. So what I think is very important is that we have a funding process that is streamlined, along with making sure we can clean up a brownfield site and doing our CEQA. Funding cycles is what is taking so long. And I just think that, you know, there are people who have died in the streets um, for not having resources and I could have housed them in my project. So it's something that's really important to me. I actually specifically look at brownfield sites. It's an issue that's just important to me for environmental justice reasons. So I don't shy away from it, especially on the east side, which is my particular focus area. The uncertainty in the development process comes from two areas. The first is really the approval process. So the time it takes to bring a project from concepts to ground picking varies widely depending on the jurisdiction you're in and depending on that jurisdiction's own process. So in some places, there are several discretionary review processes that a developer must go through to get project approval. And that creates a tremendous amount of uncertainty because at every point in that process, your project can be derailed or it can be weighed down by opposition. And so every discretionary approval that a project has to go through adds time and uncertainty, which equals cost. To the extent that a city can implement policies like having a specific plan or having design requirements approved ahead of time, they can cut down on that uncertainty and cut down on the cost to build that housing. The other uncertainty really just comes from the development process itself. You really don't know what you're going to run into until you start construction. So there's a lot of work done in the pre-development process to understand what the challenges are going to be in development. If you're building on a site that used to have a gas station, you really don't know what that's gonna look like until you start digging into the ground. But by and large, I would say those are delays that the developer can kind of try and build into their timeline to understand there is, particularly with infill development, there's a significant chance that we're going to run into something that's going to cause us to have to pause work and remediate this issue. That could add, let's say, months to a development timeline, whereas the local approval processes can add years. We've seen this a lot throughout California, depending on the level of receptiveness to the local government. And in that time it takes, that's time that people are not living in those units and our housing crisis continues to move on unabated. I kind of put the the challenges that developers, particularly infill developers, face into three broad buckets. Uh, The first one is is just the hard costs. The cost of building a unit uh, in the Bay Area is ridiculously expensive. We're seeing per unit costs for affordable housing, and I say that in in air quotes, $750,000 a door in construction costs. I mean, that's something we need to address. And there are ways getting rid of crazy parking minimums, 
looking at the over-engineering of buildings for environmental reach codes, which are really exercises in trying to squeeze the last tiny little bit of carbon out of a building. And it's adding tens of thousands of dollars in costs. Is it really worthwhile to do that? Particularly when you look at the consequences of people being forced into longer commutes. The second bucket is the process. Once you pull your permits, once you file your application and you start the long, arduous process to, to ribbon cutting, you run the gauntlet of multiple panels of review, discretionary review, legal challenges, referendums. It's a very, very painful process. Someone has a veto around every corner. So um, there, there's an awful lot of need in that particular bucket for reform and to bring down costs. And then the third bucket is the zoning bucket. We simply don't have enough land in California zoned at the right densities to meet our growing need for housing. That last bucket is where Scott Weiner has been sort of applying his trade for the last few years, trying to get significant zoning reform so we create more opportunities for housing. So yeah, we've got challenges in all three of those areas. None of them are easy. There are a few things that we're looking at that we think can really make a difference. Obviously, we've been working on accessory dwelling units for a few years, allowing every California single family homeowner to build an accessory dwelling unit, to build two accessory dwelling units, as a matter of fact, will in years to come really start taking a big bite out of our housing shortage when we see more of these uh, units come online. I mentioned parking. You're looking at $80,000 to build a stall of structured parking. If we can unbundle parking or get rid of parking requirements altogether in transit served communities, we'd be A, solving a housing affordability problem and getting cars off our streets at the same time. So I think we can do things there. Again, Unnecessary, duplicative, costly environmental regulations that, again, have very, very marginal benefits, but add greatly to the cost of a unit of housing. We need to take a look at those. And then we need to do a better job on the process. So in each of those three buckets, there's a lot of room for improvement and for savings and for the expedition of projects. This year wasn't a particularly good year in the, in the legislature for rolling back some of those regulations. We've had better years in the past. We had a bill this year that would have made housing a permissible use on land that's currently zoned for commercial and retail and that's underutilized without having to go through a costly and politically toxic rezoning process. That bill died in committee for no particularly good reason. That's the challenge you face in Sacramento politics. It's not always the best policy or the, even the best politics that, that prevail. It's, you know, you just need to be lucky sometimes. And so the solution to this is really simple. We really need to balance our housing with more development closer to jobs and transit. As our research has shown, building in a more balanced manner with more, more infill in addition to single family home building, that we can have a meaningful impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Building closer to transit with proximity to jobs reduces greenhouse gas emissions and helps us meet our state's climate goals. Also, we have to think about where we're building closer to transit, where we're building closer to jobs. You know, we have a limited amount of space in these places. By definition, infill is filling in the limited gaps we have in our existing urban fabric. And we know there's not a ton of space there. So we have to think creatively, particularly around the reuse of our existing land to accommodate new housing that achieve our greenhouse gas emission goals or our infill goals. So this includes Rethinking the use of brownfield sites, former industrial areas, making sure that they are cleaned up in an appropriate manner so that they can host housing. So we haven't done that work because there's no really good database on that. Cities themselves oftentimes do not have an inventory of the land that they control and whether or not that land is developable or not. And so that, that is difficult. Redevelopment agencies used to have a really good handle on this, but since their dissolution, that expertise doesn't always exist in, in these cities. So we don't have a good sense of what that looks like, uh, to, to be completely honest. We are doing some research on the potential for rezoning commercial corridors, uh, strip malls, shopping centers, things like that to accommodate new housing. It does take a little bit of knowing where the funding sources are 
and the wherewithal to do it. Uh, another item on my bucket list personally is to have a form of redevelopment that's targeting only brownfield sites for housing, for affordable housing, so that we could have more creative resources to get projects done. It's a lot more limited in which projects can be done, but I think we don't have enough redevelopment funds anymore since that funding source is gone. So this might be a creative way for anybody who's in legislation to go ahead and facilitate brownfield development. I, I'm still shocked. You know, I did my work in redevelopment like you probably. I, I mean, that's how I started. I was in cities and it's shocking and it's sad for the projects that were really well done with redevelopment, like affordable housing. Uh, right. We don't have anything like it for a few bad projects, but one of the reasons why I ran for office was to try to work on housing policy. But that was one of my priorities is try to come bring back a form of redevelopment specifically for brownfield sites and affordable housing. I think it's a small enough caveat that it's something that could be done in the legislature. Okay. We have a lot of land that is zoned retail or commercial right now that is probably not going to come back in as a robust of a way as before the pandemic. And so there's also an opportunity to consider whether or not these areas can be suitable sites for new housing, new affordable housing, new market rate housing. So these are the things we need to consider as we look past the pandemic and consider how we will continue to address our housing shortage moving forward. There are many things that the cities and state and the development team can do to expedite the production of housing. The city can help in terms of identifying ahead of time the location that are brownfield site and the resources that can be out there both on the public and private sector. There's a lot of things that California has done very good and recently. In October 2019, a lot of new laws were passed for affordable housing to make the land use process easier. And those laws have been great. But it's also important on these infill sites to, to think through how do you make these sites more predictable for developers and banks so they feel comfortable developing those sites. A very substantial reflection within the city of San Francisco. The Planning Commission passed a resolution apologizing to our American Indian community, our Black community, and other communities of color for the inequities that we have created through some of the local policies. And that goes back to many centuries ago when the American Indian communities were dispossessed from their own land. It goes back to the redlining policies where we limit the investments, where we limited access to housing for many of our communities of color. And there were many other pieces of legislation that really targeted our communities of color. The redevelopment designating blight in areas where we had a concentration of Black people, of Asian American uh, people. So there have been many different interventions. And at this moment, the Planning Commission, the City of San Francisco, is reflecting deeply about that. We are experiencing these tensions because of the pandemic, but also because of the historic inequities that have been built. The Equity Planning Commission resolution was passed on June 11, 2020. The Planning Department created the Community Equity Division that I'm leading. This is a new unit within the Planning Department where we're trying to identify how we assess our budget, how we identify key priorities so we can really serve those communities, so we can really address their housing needs, we can really address their economic needs, and even their open space needs. For example, the Share Spaces program, it's a program where the city streamlines the approval process and small businesses can use the street to carry their business, to carry their services, whether it's restaurants or, or shops or whatever. So we have made a special effort to do the outreach in communities that do not have a lot of resources in communities of color so we can prioritize those areas. So we can really engage with those communities, with those neighborhoods in order to support their needs rather than just the communities that have more retail activity or more resources. We have a designation of cultural districts that is a layer that also intersects with that, that identifies those less tangible resources, but that are essential for the cohesiveness of the community. We're embarking on a housing element 
and a transportation element that for the first time, those two plans will focus on, on racial and social equity as a primary dimension of the development of those documents. How can we simplify the process in a way that doesn't compromise the needs of the community, in a way that we support the goals that have been established for each community? One of the challenges that we have encountered is the alignment of infrastructure. When we have a major development effort, we need to ensure that all the street infrastructure is in place and do it project by project. It's extremely difficult and expensive, as, as you know. So there are more efforts to align those infrastructure investments more expeditiously to organize those improvements in a way that is more efficient for the city and it doesn't add a, a substantial delay in the delivery of those projects. Not all developers are comfortable with sites that have environmental contamination. And what I find is that a lot of properties are excluded from development just right off of the gate because they're deemed sort of too complex or it's hard for a developer to get an understanding. And so I think that there is a potentially a strong relationship that could develop between the community that works on environmental contamination and the affordable housing community because a lot of the sites that both of these groups are focused on are these urban infill sites, these remaining sites. We call them donut holes that are left in the city and then just seemingly each year don't get developed. But these are also the sites that affordable housing developers are looking for and the environmental community wants to get cleaned up. And so there's a real natural connection there where the environmental community could help with their expertise is reaching out to affordable housing developers and getting them comfortable with the cleanup process and what their responsibilities are on projects where they're not the responsible party that created the contaminant, and getting the affordable housing community more comfortable with properties that have a cleanup component. We just have to keep plugging away. We've had wins in the past, and we've had SB35, a win, you know, that that will hopefully get more projects built. We've had you know, reforms to the Housing Accountability Act and SB 330 by Senator Skinner. But you know, it's still not a level playing field by any stretch. If it was a level playing field for infill developers, we would not see the level of construction in the Central Valley that we continue to see. We would not see the level of sprawl. If we just gave infill developers a fighting chance, leveled the playing field in terms of costs and in terms of political certainty that those suburban, exurban, single-family home builders enjoy, I think we'll start to see more of the type of development that we all profess to want to see, but I've yet to see the type of political courage or will to make that sort of development feasible. We just have to keep coming back year after year, charging the ramparts and uh, licking our wounds at the end of the session and hopefully making a few steps forward. Mm-hmm.